Hey y'all, my dog is making a cameo. Um, I'm Chris Gula and I'm chief of content with Binge Builder. Um, this pup is sugar. Um, I joined Binge Builder um, after going to graduate school with one of our founders, Andre Washington. Um, we went to grad school for performance studies, um, which is kind of like a hybrid between theater and dance, anthropology, sociology, um, and performance art. Um, so we learned a lot there and I have a long background in um, performing arts and visual arts. I've worked in the film industry and now I'm a art consultant and designer for a firm in Austin, Texas. Awesome. Well, thank you, Chris, for that great introduction. Um, you know, super excited to be holding space with you today um, and especially learn a little bit more about that experience um, which sounds that has which sounds like it has taken you all over all over the country here from Hollywood to Texas to New York to back to Texas. So just really excited to be holding the space with you today. And so we we would love to just jump in and really talk a little bit about you know the ways that NFTs are really helping innovate the creative economy for different artists. You know we've heard a lot of words, a lot of different buzzwords around how NFTs are taking, you know, creators, um, you know, taking those innovative digital tools to the next level for creators and really allowing them to have more ownership over their own creative process and over their own pieces. So, you know, would love to jump in and, you know, dig a little bit deeper into that background of yours and understand a little bit about, you know, what, what that, background has been around transitioning into NFTs, but also around, you know, what are some of the challenges that you've seen in the space? But I'll kick it off to Mary to kickstart that conversation. Yeah, so as we know, um, internet has made it very easy to share creators' artwork. However, um, there's still a huge disproportionate amount of creators who struggle to gain support or even exposure to their work and larger audiences. Um, specifically, the pandemic has shown that um, more so the perform performative creators have probably even struggled the most in getting their work out there um, with, you know, COVID closures and all that. Um, so kind of interested to hear more about what are some challenges you have noticed into breaking in into the entertainment industry um, in terms of getting work in front of investors or even um, huge production studios? Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest challenge for folks, whether they're working in the live space or film or television or even in crypto. Um, and it's funny that you were talking about how COVID has affected folks. I just went to a live performance for the first time in probably two years last night. I saw the Worcester Group, which is this phenomenal performance troupe that's based in New York, and they're touring a project down here at Texas Performing Arts Center and one of the performers has COVID. So they had to innovate on the spot to um, make space for this performer that couldn't obviously perform. It was just a trio of folks. So um, you can feel the effects of the pandemic in live performance in every way. And I think crypto is this really amazing opportunity for folks that support the arts um, and want to be involved in processes of creating performance or film or TV or a book even, um, but don't really know how to support folks. And then folks that want to create all this content, but can't just waltz into a really big firm in LA or New York um, with their script or their pitch packet and sign a deal. Um, so there's a lot of space in crypto for folks to uh, make smaller projects and create buzz on the internet. And I think that's one of the things I'm really excited about, about BBX is that we're um, thinking about the model slightly differently instead of just like a one-off uh, purchase. We're trying to nurture people's visions as creators um, so that investors can um, work with folks at all, all levels. So if you have $10 to invest, then you can still support someone's project. Or if you have $100,000 to invest, you can support a project. And I think one of the challenges with crypto thus far has been the really uh, the barrier to access its funding. It's really hard to um, 
get enough money to mint a, a NFT on your own if you're struggling to, you know, like sell your painting or if you're trying to put up a live performance piece or if you're an actor who's going to class five days a week and then has like all of auditions and, um, you know, a show that they're trying to produce on the weekends. There haven't been a lot of opportunities for creators um, to work with their ideas and grow them in the crypto space. And I think that's been a big challenge for folks being able to get into it. Yeah, Chris, definitely. I think that I definitely agree that I think we took, you know, performance arts as for granted in pre-COVID. I can't even recall the last time I went to a performance or really participated and engaged in that. Um, Mm -hmm. So definitely agree with you in in that, you know, COVID definitely shifted um, the entertainment industry and people definitely had to innovate and think about different digital tools to to continue to democratize their art and share that with others. Um, but you know, you, you touched on something ar- around how it's it's difficult for artists to have different opportunities in regards to sharing their art, having access to funding investment. And so I'm, I'm curious why, you know, why do you think these challenges have, have continued to persist for artists? Like, I guess, yeah, I'm curious why these challenges um, continue to stay there for, for the art- artists today. I mean, that's a huge question, I think, (laughs) to be honest. Um, And, you know, every industry has its own, you know, specific issues. Like the film industry has had the studio system in the last century that created a really small network of people that were in charge of who made films and how they got distributed. Um, And that has impacted distribution of film and television around the world. And we're still sort of living in that legacy in the film and television industry. Um, And there are different versions of that in all different creative industries. You know, the commercial art market is um, really a place where people invest to make money more than people go to. I mean, a lot of people do go to enjoy art, but a lot more people are able to enjoy art at a museum rather than through purchasing it at an auction house. So the art market has really historically been a place for people with a lot of um, financial assets to be able to exercise those um, funds and, you know, get tax breaks. (laughs) So there's just these really long histories of how these industries are tied to other systems of capital gains Mm -hmm. and um and they're expensive it's expensive to like oh yeah (laughs) buy to to make a film like you have to have a camera and a cast and a crew and Mm -hmm. you have to feed them and build a set um so it takes a lot of drive to um and a lot of access and a lot of innovation to be able to even make work kind of irl um I don't know if that fully answered your question, but I think there's just a lot, you know, there's a lot of barriers Mm -hmm. because the systems have continued, um, you know, to reward the people that set them up and the people that they brought into those folds. Yeah, and you know, you definitely answered that question there. I agree, it was definitely a loaded question and <laughs> there's no right or wrong answer there. Just wanted to understand your, your perspective there. And you know, something that I, I thought was interesting that you mentioned was, you know, the fact that there a lot of artists required this, this is this huge financial barrier for the artists to break into the industry, have the, have the ability to share their, their work of art. And to your point about, you know, a lot of the times, you know, the artists can also lose that connection with their art as mm-hmm. it is being distributed or shared in a very capitalistic way, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'd love to, you know, jump in. We talked a little bit of way, about the ways that COVID um, really, you know, encouraged different creators to innovate and adapt to um, their creative processes to a different digital world. And so I'd love to just switch gears here a bit. And I, I'd love to just jump into how, you know, NFTs in Web3 are really helping some of these challenges that, you know, you spoke about. Yeah. Um, to me, this is like the most exciting thing about NFTs and Web3 and um, crypto in the creative space. Um, 
I mean, it's just completely disrupting the industry. Um, mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I had been talking about the art market and the art market, you know, somebody just, one of, actually one of my friends in LA that does film just texted me like, what are the big galleries in New York that someone would know of? And I like rattled them off and I was like, it's been the same top five galleries for <laughs> like a long time. Um, but, you know, those galleries weren't the places where people first started buying NFTs. And so that has really shifted the market to a completely different demographic of artists really quickly. Um, and I don't know that that will continue to be um, the path for visual art as NFTs, but I do think it's going to continue to open up a lot of pathways for artists in different realms. I just listened to a podcast um, that was um, speaking about how NFTs would change the gaming community and yeah. there will be this like potential for people, like a lot of the models for gaming communities now are sort of pay to play and there will be these new and already are these new models of like play to earn so that there's a way to like earn equity through playing games online um which will really completely flip that industry mm -hmm. um, and for performance obviously i could go about on about this in a lot of ways i think in, for performance and um other like time-based art it's really hard to sell your art when you know you have to be in a in a theater with me while I do the thing. <laughs> and then what's left over from that thing is, you know, like a playbill or the script or the costumes, but it's not like an object that you can take home to your house. It's not, you know, a video that you can pay, play, not a video anymore, but you know what I mean, um, a file. So there's this opportunity to sort of create different assets for your project that can then be sold as NFTs and also used to um, as marketing tools and also as ways to like work with collaborators in different industries to grow your idea into something that's um, in a lot of ways a lot bigger than like the you know a one-off performance or um, just selling a script to a studio. Yeah definitely no I really appreciate that and I think one thing that stood out to me while you were letting us know how, you know, how Web3 and NFTs can really mitigate gaps in the artist world and different type of art form, I, um, was how it could open up many different opportunities. And you alluded to kind of the tools of like what NFTs can offer um, specifically for um, art, time-based art. So can you talk more, a little bit more about like what tools does NFTs and Web3 have um, to really change the landscape for creators, um, like you mentioned, more performer creators um, in the entertainment industry. So, um, Kate Moss was selling NFTs of her like intimate life of like her sleeping or you know, like <laughs> brushing her teeth or something, and those are some of the like time based, um, yeah. like sort of recorded live performance, some of the bigger NFTs to sell in the beginning. And it was like, oh my gosh, like there's so much opportunity for um, performance to enter like the market in that way. And I think performance and performance sort of as an umbrella term for um, like dance and theater, except for not Broadway theater. Broadway theater is like so in the market and like on it, but like a lot of other types of performance really haven't like been a part of the market in the same way. And so there's this opportunity to create like these tangible, sellable objects um, that are not the thing itself, like the performance, but they're also in relation to it. And I can see that being a really valuable um, way of connecting with audiences. Um, I, I'm a person that makes performance and a curator and I love supporting artists. And one of the main ways that I do that is by buying tickets to their shows. Um, and most shows were not ticketed during the pandemic when they were virtual. Um, so I found myself like subscribing to people's Patreon or making individual donations in ways that I really hadn't thought to do much in the past. And I was a graduate student, so I didn't have the same um, 
sort of income bracket that I do after graduation. But during my research for my graduate program, I was looking at live performance and curation. And what I found was so many people that loved and supported live art, um, but didn't really understand how difficult the system was for getting funding and circulating funding and didn't have like direct opportunities to support artists aside from buying tickets or making donations, mm. um, which a lot of people do, but a lot of other people that wouldn't think to like make a one-off donation to an organization every year might really want to buy an NFT of, you know, uh, a performer talking about how they conceptualized some show. Um, so I just think there's a way to like grow audience and also, um, connect people that want to support artists to artists. Yeah, I think that's definitely a great point. And, you know, I definitely had a, a similar experience where I, you know, subscribed to a couple of patrons, was trying <laughs> to follow different artists. Um, but to your point there, um, that's, you know, I, that what really stood out there was, yeah, a lot of, there was a lot of virtual events that were happening and there was no way to really, you know, bring that value back to the creator if, you know, if this event has, is like a free event where anyone can come in and there's no way to give, give that back, like give that value back to the creator. And so I think with that, I know you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, NFTs being very valuable in regards to allowing the creator to build assets around their performance. Can you expand on that a little bit more? I'd love to just, you know, tap a little bit deeper into that economic economic value that an NFT can have for those, for different types of creators and specifically around performance. But yeah, I would love to touch, touch on that a bit more. Yeah, um, I might actually switch and talk a little bit about some of the artists we're working at BBX um, oh, yeah, and then loop back to performance because we're not working with any performers, um, performance makers right now. Um, but some of our artists have created assets for their projects. I'm thinking particularly of one of our artists that um, is fundraising to make a feature film and she created NFTs um, that are uh, visual assets, um, but they also relate to the plot of the film. And so in order to be interested in the NFT, um, you sort of dive into the film itself and its plot. And um, I think you sort of like get a little hooked in, which mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in a way that it, like it's a little bit more personal to be able to um, see how someone wants to share their work outside of the form that they intend for it to like be in its finished product. And maybe to explain that, like, how would you create, you know, an image that moves like a GIF um, for your play that's about um, mm -hmm. like your mother who passed away. And it might be like this really specific object, like a locket or, mm -hmm. um, a, a dog collar or something and then in a, you learn a lot more about the project itself through like learning about these assets around the project yeah that's that's incredible um and you know the reason why i'm i'm really saying that is you know what we're hearing a lot with nfts today is you know you're seeing people trading nfts and mm -hmm. you know talking about making big money quickly um but what i love about what you're saying is really taking nfts to a deeper and more emotional level like we're, we're connecting with the artists in terms of these nfts that are emotion that in a way are, is an emotional connection within this artist that we're building and so i think that that's not talked about often in what we're hearing today in regards to you know trading those nfts and you know <laughs> making sure to um, to see, I guess, only seeing those financial gains versus, you know, the next level of NFTs, which is really what you're talking about, which is this deep emotional connection with the art, the artist's work and connecting in a very different way. Um, but I, I love that. I think that's incredible. And, you know, and of course, you know, the reason why we're here is, you know, Binge Builder. So we'd love to talk a little bit more about Binge Builder as well. Definitely. Um, so we know that Binge Builders is truly designed to really incentivize um, investment in original 
and engaging properties of diverse um, artists. So can you tell us how your work in curatorial practice really connects with BBX's mission in, the, in investing in diverse content? Yeah, um, I think this also connects to sort of what I was saying about the NFT's um, potential to have like a lot of resonance. Um, there's a lot of creative content out there that is really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody knows about it. And right. it's not because like, it's not because it's not absolutely amazing. It's because people have different access to mm -hmm. different, uh, you know, everyone has a different set of experiences and privileges and disprivileges. And um, as we were talking about before, there's like these very like kind of slim roads to get mm -hmm. into mainstream production for a film or to even in the performance art world, like it's a pretty small circuit of arts presenters who can help you tour your work nationally and internationally. Um, and again, it, it's not necessarily that all of the shows that we see on Netflix are the best shows. It's right. that those are the shows that had access and timing and all these other factors. Mm -hmm. um, and I love this model because it sort of flips it. And like, instead of investing in, you know, like Hamilton after you went and saw Hamilton <laughs> and, um, you know, like buying, uh, a Lin-Manuel Miranda book afterwards, or, you know, uh, downloading the soundtrack. It's like sort of an opportunity to flip that. And um, Lin-Manuel Miranda, you know, had a really specific path that he went through uh, institution of higher education and very specific networks. And it wasn't very easy for him. Um, but a lot of people would say he was lucky. And, um, I don't think that's how those industries should work. And I don't think that's how any of us at Binge Builder think they should work. Um, so it's this opportunity to uh, support artists that, and creators that have really beautiful visions and drive and they're organized and very capable um, and let users see their work before it's created and have the opportunity to help them create it. Um, and I think we're thinking about diversity in a lot of different ways. I know you'd asked about that. Um, definitely in terms of like race, gender, sexuality, um, sort of all the identity markers that are mm -hmm. part of uh, larger conversations and especially in the film industry that need to, a lot of work. But no, in all those industries, honestly, we, you know, but we're also thinking about diversity of like, of genres and we're thinking about age and mm -hmm. and access points and i think it's it's really exciting to work with an organization that's thinking about that term which is like such a buzzword right now in a really broad way um so that we're not pigeonholing mm -hmm. the type of work that can succeed on our platform yeah, that's that's really great background there into binge, binge builder and definitely to your point one of the great things about the platform is that we're really thinking about diversity not just in terms of our creators but also in terms of our content which is incredible i I'd, I'd love to hear from you because i know you you've had some experience here at bitch builder you know reaching out to artists connecting with different creators can you talk to us about you know what are some of the projects the most i guess projects that you're, you're most excited about um you know being part of the a bit, part of bitch builder yeah um this is making me realize that you had asked about my curatorial practice um in the last <laughs> question i didn't necessarily answer that question um <laughs> yes yeah, so I think I'll add, answer that question and then talk a little bit. Um, so my my research for my graduate program focused on curating and performance, and it really gave me a lot of insight into how artists are able to present their work and how it tours and um, how organizations get funding and how tireless, tirelessly curators of performance work to try to help make 
performances and exhibitions and projects happen. And so that experience really resonated with what I saw happening in the film industry when I was working in casting in LA. Um, and even, you know, back to like auditioning as an actor and the struggles of like breaking into industry. Um, so I feel like I've kind of come cir full circle with um, Binge Builder because it's, it's a way to see how there's this gap across different industries mm -hmm. where people want to connect with one another and want to support uh, things that matter to them, but don't necessarily know how or have the access to. And then people that are really talented and have different stories to tell than other people that stories that we hear very often um, don't have access to the ways to make those things happen. And that's um, that's what I'm excited about and where I hope my expertise fits in with Binge Builder <laughs> to be able to sort of see the nuances of, all right, how do we take your script and um, make that into something that can live uh, on Web3 and interact with people who maybe don't know much about reading scripts. So do we record a podcast about the script where um, you talk about writing it? Or, you know, do we hire actors to do some snippets? Um, really thinking about how to take their creative processes and make them um, not, and like help them mm -hmm. figure out how they want to um, engage with crypto through those projects. Definitely. Um, and, and we are sure that your expertise is definitely value add to Bench Builder. <laughs> and we are super excited to see just the different artists that will, will be elevated through our um, Bench Builder platform. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And really, we have um, an artist who's looking to write a children's book um, oh about, <laughs> um, uh, about human trafficking. Um, the the artist Evelyn was human trafficked and kept as a, a um, contemporary slave in the United States, um, and so she has this beautiful project um, that is a children's book to help children gain understanding and knowledge of uh, contemporary slavery and trafficking, and also it's a bigger life project that's also a social justice project and an educational project and it's really exciting to see how what ha she already has you know national and international support for her cause and her story is like incredibly powerful and heartbreaking and important um but it's amazing to think about creating a children's book and mm -hmm. helping children hold on to these really difficult realities of life and potentially be able to um, change some of these really awful systems. And she um, is having a hard time fundraising that book project. And like, I personally want to help fund that book project. And so it's exciting to think about like, what are gonna be the NFTs that we can share to help Evelyn um, tell the story in the format that she wants to tell it. Um, so I'm really excited about that project and um, getting folks who are already invested in her story to be able to be a bit closer to it. And then also helping her grow her network and tell her story to different audiences as well. Yeah, that, that's incredible. Um, you know, and, you know, going back to that point there about these stories that are so important to be heard and to be shared, um, not just in terms of, you know, that initial funding, but in terms of just the importance of, you know, having that, you know, be widespread and really represented in our in our media, which is something that we don't see. And so, yeah, I think that's incredible. And I know that we'll definitely look forward to, to that children's book and, you know, seeing that available in Binge Builder and you know having that story shared you know across across the world um because it's definitely stories like like those are stories that really matter and you know that we're excited um in terms of reasons why we joined binge builder to hear and to be a part of definitely but and so to wrap up the crypto corners we do have two rapid fires questions for you Chris. okay <laughs> 
So in five words, describe NFTs. Uh, secure. Uh, internet. Confusing. <laughs> Possibility. <I see>. <laughs> <laughs> Permanent. Great, great. You know, I love the secure part, but also the confusing part. <laughs> <laughs> and please tell us, where can we find you on social media? What's your handle? <laughs> oh, I'm at Steve Willem. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for being part of Crypto Corner. Really excited to learn about all the new artists you will be onboarding to Binge Builder.